this morning doing a similar thing, and um, I think we've got a bigger crowd here, so we're really pleased to uh, thank you for coming. My name is Glenn Lyons. I'm the uh, CEO of the Downtown Community Alliance in Des Moines, which is part of the Greater Des Moines Partnership. And we work with a group of uh, organizations in Des Moines that are promoting passenger rail throughout the state, and as this slide shows, we actually work with Chambers of Commerce from across the state promoting uh, passenger rail because we think that it's the right thing for this century in Iowa. It's an economic development tool, it's a social de development tool, it's a great way to travel. And um, we've been going through a process of bringing in uh, speakers who work in other cities where rail is being built, has been built, and we have a couple good speakers today. But I'm going to turn it over to Barry uh, Cleveland and let him in see this. Well, thank you, Glenn. Um, welcome, Mayor Hannafin. <laughs> right on time as usual. Um, I'm Barry Cleveland. I'm also a Department of Transportation Commissioner for the state of Iowa. I've been here for 10 years and uh, we've asked to moderate this in the place of the, the mayor here. A um, little history. Um, this is the 151st anniversary of the Union Pacific Railroad, and Council Plus just happens to be mile marker zero for the Union Pacific Railroad. What you may or may not know is just a few blocks away from here, August 13, 1859, uh, president to be Abraham Lincoln. He actually was running for the nomination uh, to become president, so 15 months before he became president. He overlooked the valley here and decided with General Dodge that this was the place to start the, uh, the Transcontinental Railroad. So that happened 154 years ago, not too far from here. So I think it's appropriate we all meet here today. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our, our first speaker, Patricia Quinn. She's joining us from Maine. Um, Patricia Quinn is a native of Norwich, Connecticut and holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration Marketing from Eastern Connecticut State University. Uh, Patricia moved to Maine in eight, 1987 and worked as a group tour planner prior to a successful career as a hotel general manager. She joined the Northern New England Passenger Rail Authority in October 2000 to promote the inauguration of the Down Easter and was officially appointed Executive Director of the Northern New England Passenger Rail Authority in September 2005. Patricia is involved in regional and national passenger rail initiatives throughout her involvement with the States for Passenger Rail Coalition, the AASHTO Standing Committee on Rail Transportation, the Northeast Corridor Commission, and the National Cooperative Rail Research Program. Locally, Patricia serves on the Board of Directors of the Portland Convention and Visitors Bureau and the Maine Development Foundation. Patricia received the Amtrak President's Service and Safety Award for State Partners in 2007 and was recognized as one of Maine's most intriguing people by Portland Magazine in 2009 and a woman to watch by Maine Biz in August 2011. So let's give a warm Council Bluffs welcome to Patricia Quinn. to be here. Um, I, I was hoping maybe to warm up just a tad. Um, I understand it's 50 degrees back home today and the weather is moving in that direction, so I think this is what I'm going to wake up to tomorrow too, but I'm not a stranger to it. Well, I want to thank you very much for inviting me here today. Um, it's great to be here to talk about something that, as I said this morning, I'm very, very proud of. We started passenger rail service in the state of Maine and restored it um, back in December of 2001. Um, and that started as a result of a, passenger, a, a, a public initiative, a citizen's initiative. A group of citizens decided that they wanted Amtrak service back. There hadn't been service between Portland and Boston in over 30 years. Um, and, you know, had a lot of meetings, a lot of work, were able to get the funding. And um, in 2001, the Down Easter started rolling. Um, the commissioner spoke about um, a lot of history here, and certainly, um, you know, the railroad is very steeped in history. And oftentimes, um, you know, people that are involved in the railroad industry are involved in it because they've been in it for a long time or it's part of their family. I'm, I'm actually not a railroader. Um, my father was a plumber. He didn't work for the railroad. I didn't know anybody who worked for the railroad. In fact, I never rode a train before November of 2001 when I went to 
when we started taking reservations for the Dan Easter service, and I, I honestly don't even have one of those train sets down in my basement, but this is just kind of what I do for work, and I've come to really appreciate it. And again, my background is in business. I have a degree in business. I managed hotels before I came here. So I'm here to talk to you today a little bit about the business of passenger rail. Let me grab my handy dandy thing here and see how this works. All right. First, I want you to meet the team. Northern Oil and Passenger Rail Authority sounds like a big and mighty organization, and there we are. There are six and a half of us, six full-time employees, one part-time employee. Um, we do consider ourselves the business managers of the Down Easter. Um, and the Down Easter is the name of our train, obviously. We have a, a manager of budget and administration who um, manages all of our finances, grants, make sure that we're complying, and we get money from lots of different sources. So she does a great job doing that. Um, we have Brian Beeler, who's our manager of passenger services, who's out in the field managing the, some of the relationships and partnerships that we have, working in stations, dealing with customer issues. Jim Russell is our project manager, and uh, we have about 50 to 60 million dollars in capital projects underway right now, so he's out there managing those for us. Natalie and Angela are our marketing department, and marketing director, and our new uh, graphic design person who do all the great stuff you're going to see here uh, a little bit later. And Terry is our data analyst and she collects all our information and uh, lots of resources because we monitor performance, we monitor the operation very, very closely so we collect lots of information uh, so that we have good data to make good business decisions. So as the business managers of the Down Easter, one of the most important things that we do is we manage partnerships. We have a lot of partnerships. We have a, obviously a very important and a very close partnership with Amtrak. We have partnerships with our host railroads. Um, we operate over three of them. Um, with our station communities, with our federal funding partners, our local um, communities, our state fed funding partners. So lots of partnerships. The passengers really are at the center of what we do because we do operate a passenger rail business. And if the passengers aren't happy, um, then really nothing else is going to work right. If the passengers are happy, it's amazing how the rest of the pieces tend to fall into place. Promotion. We do all the promotion for the Down Easter. Performance, as I said, monitor performance in terms of customer satisfaction, meeting financial goals, compliance, um, and purpose. Because we found that as a, a public agency and public transportation, we're not just here to make a buck. In fact, we don't make bucks at all. We tend to lose them, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but we provide a lot of public benefits, so that's what we do. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Down Easter and try to put into context where I come from and the service that I'm talking about so it'll help you understand um, as we go forward. As I said, it started in 2001 as a citizen's initiative and in order to get the Down Easter um, to operate, uh, about a $63 million investment was required to uh, take the freight rail line um, between the Massachusetts New Hampshire state border. South of the New Hampshire state border, there's commuter rail that runs, so that rail was okay for passenger. But north of that, it wasn't. So it took about $63 million to rehab uh, the freight rail line for passenger standards. The service itself, the Amtrak Down Easter, makes five round trips a day between Portland and Boston. Two of those trips extend north about 30 miles to Freeport and Brunswick. Uh, the trip between Portland and Boston is about 116 miles plus 30. That's a 146-mile route. We um, operate through three states because in order to get from Portland to Boston, you have to go through Massachusetts. We're not high speed. We operate at 79 miles an hour, is our top authorized speed. And we run our service using three sets of equipment. And we service 12 station communities um, and operate over three host railroads, Pan Am between in Maine and uh, for most of Maine, the Maine Department of Transportation owns one mile of right away on which we operate now, and then the MBTA, as I said. So it's a kind of a complex little operation. We're considered an Amtrak state-supported service, meaning that NEPRA holds the contract with Amtrak for the operation of service. We're not part of the original system. Um, so back in the 90s, when this was getting started, the state went to Amtrak and said, you know, we want to have an agreement with you. And they said, that's great. We'll provide service for you, but you pay us for that. So we've been doing that all along, paying for that service. So the, we have a 20-year agreement that started in 2001, and NEPRA holds that agreement. We negotiate our costs every year. And part of that agreement, under that agreement, Amtrak provides the equipment, they maintain the equipment, the crews, the conductors and engineers are Amtrak employees. We have uh, three ticket agents in, at the Portland station who are Amtrak um, employees. Amtrak does the reservations and ticketing, which is why um, if you book a ticket on the Down Easter, you, you know, call 1-800-USA-RAIL. 
And they also hold most of the host railroad agreements directly because it's railroad to railroad, but we do all the capital, um, if there's capital improvements to be made, NEPRA negotiates directly with the railroad agreements, uh, with the railroads. So um, that's how that's set up. We have a great working relationship. And even though we are an Amtrak service, again, Amtrak's kind of like a, kind of like a contractor to us. Um, and we, we hire other people to do different services for us. For instance, we're the only Amtrak service in the country that has its own food service. We contract independently with a company called Epicurean Feast to provide um, food in the Down Easter Cafe. And that's really helped us to develop a real cool identity and a brand um, for our train. Because we're able to put it on local products. We serve clam chowder in the summertime. We have lobster rolls. We have these things called wicked whoopies. They're just devil bugs. Um, they're round. Um, wicked Whoopies, we work with local confectioners, Wilbur's Chocolates, and you know lots of different local merchants, which gives them business, also showcases um, their products to people from all over who ride our train, um, and uh, helps really kind of get us a, a, a sense of personality. Lots of other amenities on the train. All Amtrak trains now are equipped with Wi-Fi, but we had it two years before they did. We came up with our own solution. We were the first uh, Amtrak train in the country to switch to e-ticketing. In fact, we were the pilot for that. Worked with them for years before it was rolled out. We have volunteer train hosts on our trains. The same advocacy group that got the service started back in the in you know 2001. That same group is actively involved in the service today, and they have volunteers who ride on our peak trains to give out information to people about the destinations that they're going, how to make subway connections, bus connections, what to do, where to go for lunch. And we do tons and tons of special events and programs, whether they be marketing programs, community programs, all kinds of things um, to be out there and showcase our service and help the communities. Now, for the most part, the Down Easter is a very important transportation alternative. And as you folks know here with your climate, sometimes it's hard to drive. When the airport's closed and the roads really aren't very good, you know, there's not very much that's going to stop one of those P-42 locomotives blowing down the, down the, uh, down the corridor. So um, it's very reliable and can provide service in all kinds of weather. It's also completely accessible. Um, when we first started operating service, there were, I remember one time a lady called me and she said that her husband had been in a wheelchair and they hadn't been able to go anywhere and certainly hadn't been to Boston in decades. And now they were able to go because um, the Down Easter was here and made it easy. And connectivity. And connectivity is so, so important. Now, one difference, I think we share a lot um, between where I come from and, and where we are now um, in terms of, you know, um, appreciation for our environment and quality of life. But where we're very different is in terms of geography. Because you folks are right in the middle of a lot of stuff. We're up in the upper right-hand corner. Um, and kind of geographically remote. But connectivity is so, so important to developing an economy. That you have to be able to, you know, connect to different places so that you can transport effectively people, goods, and information. And that's the cornerstone of any economy. So the connectivity of our communities to the national system is really important. And for a lot of our communities, has really put them on the map. So who are our communities? I'm just going to go through quickly and just talk to you a little bit about the towns that are involved. So as we talk about some of these benefits, you can kind of put it into context. Picture there's Portland, Maine. Portland is the largest city in Maine, 60,000 people. The greater Portland area is 120,000 people. And then we have Boston. We connect to Boston, which is about 4.5 million people. In fact, Boston is a hub. It's the economic center of New England. And providing that connectivity is really important. 86% of the people who travel on the Down Easter ride it because they're on their way to or from Boston. And, we have, we, and one of the reasons we have expanded our service to other communities is to develop a better inbound tourism market. But Boston really is, is the center, so that's, that's how we go. About half of our riders, a little more, um, live in the state of Maine. We have about a third from uh, New Hampshire, less from Massachusetts, and then we have people from all over the country. In fact, we do surveys periodically, and we'll you know, do them for a month, and it's amazing to me that you know, over the course of a one-week period you look at, there'll be you know, 22, 23 states um, represented in the surveys of people that are on, the, on our, uh, our train. The communities we serve, however, are much different. And even though Portland is kind of the metropolis of Maine, um, everything's relative, you know. Um, the other stations are very small. For instance, Old Orchard Beach. We only stop in Old Orchard Beach between April and October. It's a classic beach community where they basically turn the lights on uh, on Memorial Day and they turn them off on Labor Day. Um, but it's a great little community and the train stop is right in the middle of downtown. And we actually promote, you know, bring your cooler, bring your beach umbrella, get off the train and you're steps away from the beach. And that's exactly how it works and that's great. 
Saco, Maine is a very small community as well, about, well, it's about 20,000 people. It's next door to Birfa. These were on, on the Saco River, so they're old mill communities, big old mills. Most of them made blankets and textiles and those kinds of things. That the doors have been closed for decades and decades and decades, and most of these mills don't even have windows in a very small little downtown center, but a very small community. Wells is another kind of ocean community, and that particular station is, um, is located in, in kind of a, an area that's very accessible by the highway and by the, um, and by the train. The two newest communities we just added in Maine are Brunswick and Freeport, and like I said, we're very excited to have them on board. Um, Freeport, obviously, is the number one tourist destination in the state of Maine, other than the Acadia National Park. It's the home of L.L. Bean, and they have all kinds of great shopping and outdoor discovery schools. And the train station, again, you get off, and there's the L.L. Bean loop right up the hill, so it's very, very easy to get around. In Brunswick, a charming community, College Town. Um, Bowdoin University is, um, is located right in Brunswick and they have lots of amenities as well. The three stations we have in New Hampshire, Dover, Dorm, and Exeter, again, and incidentally all of those main stations that I just explained to you, the population area of those for all of those stations is about 150,000 people. Three stations that we have in Dover, Dorm, and Exeter. <coughs> Dover again was another mill town, it's on, on a river. Dorm um, is the home of the University of New Hampshire. And actually, our train stops in the middle of the campus. And Exeter is a kind of small, suburban, rural, very quaint colonial community. So those are the communities that we serve in Maine and New Hampshire. But who are the people that we serve? And a lot of times, people will ask me, who rides the train? Who rides the Downeaster? And the answer I always give is, who doesn't ride the Downeaster? Because we have such a wide variety and mix of people that ride the train that it's really hard to you know, find one particular group. Now, in some ways, that's great. In other ways, it's challenging. And that's why we have to do a lot of marketing. Because we're always looking at giving people excuses of why they should ride the train. So we have about everybody. College students love the train. There are 60 institutions of higher learning along our corridor. And college students, we have a special pass for college students. And they just love it. Sports fans, Celtics, Bruins are right within the same station that we pull into in Boston, and the Red Sox are just a, a subway right away, so we do a lot with sporting events, cultural events. Families love it because they want to go to Boston to do things or come to Maine. It's great for kids to be able to move around. Business travelers, we have about 250 people a day who take our train to get to work and they're regular commuters. But intermittent business travelers love us too. Um, I said this morning that we have a lot of lawyers because they can get billable hours while they're riding on the train. <laughs> but we have Wi-Fi and they can plug in and do all of that. Seniors love it, tourists love it. So it really is a wide cross-section of all kinds of people from a, a, a wide variety of locations and reasons for travel. And so we market. Our marketing is very diverse. It's very active. We're always trying to find different groups. And we use the basic, you know, the newspaper and television advertising, social media now. We also do contests. We send out email blasts. We do have special programs. I mentioned to you about um, a college six ticks that we have. It's a pass for you know, students. College students can buy it, and they get six trips for $76, and they, you know, can ride any time that they want. We have the Downeaster Discovery Program, which was, is a field trip program for school kids. We take about 8,000 school kids back and forth to Boston um, to go for educational trips. Um, we have a partnership with the American Cancer Society um, where we offer discounts to passengers that are referred to Boston hospitals for cancer treatments. And a lot of those folks, they wouldn't be able to afford to go back and forth or they're too sick to drive. So being able to go on the train along with the companion has really been a game changer for them. So um, we do lots and lots of things to market and keep those the train as full as we can. So what have the results been? Well, since 2001, we've transported about 4.2 million people. Remember, I told you we have 1.3 million people in our state. New Hampshire has 1.3 million people in their state. So that's kind of, those are big numbers for us. And you can see when we started ridership, the first full fiscal year we operated was 2003. And then as time went on, ridership continued to grow. We continued to make improvements in service. We added a frequency, reduced some travel time. Um, but as it caught on, people started realizing it wasn't just an amenity, it was a way to get around and started riding. Our ridership in fiscal year 2005 was 250,000 passengers, 250,000 passengers. And last year, fiscal year 2012, our ridership was 528,000 passengers. So it's more than double in that period of time. Um, Another important thing to remember is that those riders have taken 336 million passenger miles off of our roads. And if you know anything about roads, 
it's very expensive to maintain roads. In fact, I know in the state of Maine, every time there's a snowstorm, you dump them over a million dollars in salt and sand on the road just to get the snow clear. So taking miles off the road helps the wear and tear and helps the maintenance off the roads as well. We have one of the highest customer satisfaction ratings in the entire Amtrak system, and we maintain a really good on-time performance thanks to our partnership with our freight railroad, meaning that the trains pretty much run on time. And again, we just completed a major expansion, $38 million in funding to rehab the line 30 miles north. But we are not close to done. We have facilities to build. We want to increase our service to seven round trips a day. We want to reduce our travel time. And there's some other places in Maine that we're going to expand to as well. So this is definitely a work in progress. Well, we talked a little bit about money and roads, but the downeaster costs money too. Um, and no, it does not pay for itself. In fact, very few um, public infrastructures do pay for themselves. I'll give you just a little snapshot of what our budget is. In fiscal year 2012, our annual operating budget was about $15 million, and that covered the cost of the train, the railroad maintenance, my salary, the crew salary, the marketing, everything that goes into it. Now, out of that, we get about $8 million back in passenger revenues. So that leaves a gap of about $7 million. The state of Maine pays for that, about a little over, uh, they allocate some of their federal CMAQ dollars, which are congestion mitigation air quality, it's a federal program. They allocate about $5.6 million, that covers 80% of the gap, and then the $1.4 million difference comes from the state taxpayers. It's a lot of money, and we understand that. Again, it's a small state, but as I said, everything costs money. The DOT budget is you know, $600 million a year to maintain the road, so it costs money. But we're very conscious of that. And in order to continue to sustain that, because it shows up on our balance sheet a little bit differently, it's important for us to make sure that it's worth it. How do you know that that money, you're actually, you're actually getting good value for that? And that's why one of the phrases we use is, we've found over the course of time, because we appreciate, and you know, we, we need to make sure that it's always a good business decision for the state um, to, to help make, you know, make that gap, that the Downeaster really is more than just a train ride. That the public benefits um, of the service extend far beyond just the nice time people have when they're on the train. And the financial benefits of the service ex extend far beyond what we collect in the fare <coughs> box. Because investments that are made in passenger rail are not just important to the people who ride the train, they're important to people in the, in the entire region, and I'm going to explain why. The Downeaster has really demonstrated itself to be not just a transportation alternative, but an economic engine for the region. And we knew this was happening as we started running for a few years, and so we hired a company from Chicago to come and kind of do a study and try to quantify for us what we could expect for economic benefits. We were looking at expanding, investing more money, and how do you know that we're going to get a good return on that investment? So they did. And they came and they looked at the area and what was happening and, you know, looked at trends and different things. And they said that by 2030, that there would be $7.2 billion in con private construction that would happen along our corridor and station communities, generating over 17,000 jobs. They said that the transportation savings that people would have from not driving in their own car would put $244 million a year back into the economy and that from tourists and different other kinds of revenues, that the, the tax and revenues for Maine and New Hampshire would increase by $76 million. Now those are pretty impressive numbers when you're looking at an $8 million, $7 million a year subsidy. And we took that to the legislature and they believed it. But is that really true? Those are big numbers. Is that really going to happen and how do we know? Well, I'm going to tell you how it does. Since that time, we've been watching these things very close and we've been keeping tabs on these things. And this is what we found. We have found that the Downeaster does indeed stimulate private and public development near our stations. In fact, in those little old blanket factory towns of Saco and Biddeford and the little, the little beach town of Old Orchard Beach, right now there's $250 million of private investment happening in those towns. The mill complexes have been bought, they're being renovated, they're beautiful apartments, they're retail space, there's a boutique hotel that's going to be in. Um, 300 housing units. Are, are being developed, plus there's over 100 that have been in there already. And people are moving there and living there because they know that they can live in a place where it's quiet and they have a quality of life and a wonderful small downtown community. But if they need to, for work, get to Boston, they can hop on the train and they can be there easily and economically. 
um, in Saco, they built a brand new train station, which has really become the center of their community. The Chamber of Commerce is there. Um, you go in there in the afternoon, and there are people playing checkers, and they're watching the train come, and it was a, it's a green train station. Uh, I know windmills aren't real big, they're not like big news to you folks around here. You have a lot of them. We don't have so many, but they have a windmill. They generate their own power. And Old Orchard Beach, right next to their pier and on the beach where there's some, you know, french fry and cotton candy stands, now there's a beautiful high-end condominium complex. And in fact, in Old Orchard Beach alone, 808 new residential housing units have been built since 2005. And most of them say that the catalyst for this was the accessibility and the availability of, of, of the train. Downey Store encourages business growth and development. We've seen this in New Hampshire as they've transformed a little ice cream shop into a beautiful station and a sustainable restaurant. They've restored the historic characteristics of what was a previously a rail station. But the University of New Hampshire is actually using the Down Easter for their master planning. They're using it as a centerpiece for all their planning going forward. Another interesting fact, UNH campus of I think about 18,000 kids has always had for years and years, as long as they can remember, a lottery for parking passes because more kids wanted to bring their cars on campus than they had room for. We all remember those lottery days from college, right? This was the first year they called up and said this is the first year they have a surplus of parking passes. Because so many kids are riding the train, they don't even want to use their cars anymore. They don't want to bring them there. They cost too much money. The Children's Museum of Maine moved from Portsmouth, New Hampshire to Dover, New Hampshire, because they wanted to be within walking distance of the rail station. And in fact, in Dover, it's really become the economic hub of their region of New Hampshire. Lots of new development. Again, about 300, 300 um, residential units being uh, built adjacent to the train station. And a parking, a surface parking lot is being developed into a mixed-use development with parking on one floor and other things in the, in, on the, in the upper floors. And Exeter, a business that had moved away several years ago, is now moving back again because there are so many people in activity and connectivity to the train. Down Easter creates new opportunities for investment and growth in places that there didn't seem like there was a lot of hope. Where our Portland station is located is a place called Thompson's Point. You can see it down the bottom there. Um, you can see those little white boxes. Um, those are either abandoned warehouses or, or tractor trailer trucks that get stored there. This is a beautiful piece of property right on the river. The airport is there, and it's kind of the gateway to Portland. But nobody's done anything with this for years. But these developers, John Jennings and Bill Ryan, have come in. Uh, they have um, gotten $100 million in private investment, and they're building a basketball arena for our NBA minor league league team, um, an associated sports medicine complex. There's a hotel going in there, a 700-car parking garage, retail space, office space, an arena, a performing arts hall. And within the next five years, that point is going to be transformed to an, a, a, an entirely different kind of community. In Brunswick, where we just started operating in November of this past year, um, I talked to you about how the Brunswick had that nice downtown, and they had the college. Well, between the, Brun the, the downtown and the college, the one block in between was this area that there was nothing. It was a brownfield site. And when we started talking to them about the train coming, a private developer decided to take a chance, bought that in cooperation with the, with the town. They had it all remediated. And all those buildings that you see right there are now where that brownfield site were, and it's our train station. The private developer built these big buildings, left room inside one for a train station. There's restaurants, retail shops. Upstairs is the um, city council chambers. There's a, um, a walk-in medical clinic, an orthopedic center. Um, a bank is moving in there. Um, and all this, this whole little community that has developed, um, and including a hotel, which incidentally did not even break ground until we were sure that we, uh, we had our grant secured to bring uh, train service there. And then you can see our train pulling right into the station there. So that's been an amazing transformation of that community. Down Easter also encourages a lot of community pride. People just love trains, and it has a way of just pulling people together. When we had our inaugural run of our train to Freeport and Brunswick on November 1st, more than 400 people came out in Freeport to welcome that train, and more than 600 people in Brunswick. It was an amazing day. People were so excited, and any time you go there, the train pulls out of Brunswick every morning at 7 o'clock. If you go there and stand there, you're not only going to see the passengers that are going to get on, you're going to see people that just stand there and watch it. One gentleman actually called and told me that he changed the time he takes his trash out in the morning because he lives near the railroad tracks so he can wave at the train when it goes by. <laughs> but it also 
Well, it doesn't just affect the communities that it, it serves, it really impacts the entire state. Because the investments that we've made in the corridor to sustain passenger service has really helped out our freight railroad passenger. Because freight trains used to move at 10 miles an hour before we upgraded them to passenger standards, and now they move at 40 miles an hour. That's got to be better. And you know what? Hundreds of miles away where the paper mills are up in our state, business is booming and their transportation costs can stay low because they can move their goods back and forth. And it's been a huge economic boom for that area as well. The service has really provided opportunities to create and sustain jobs. Now there's about 100 of us that are directly employed with the operation of the Down East. But there are hundreds and hundreds of others in the construction industry, the retail industries, all the support industries that we serve all the time. In fact, our, I you know, talked about that $15 million operating budget. Out of that, we do business with 200 main companies every year. So that money is com uh, continually working through the economy and stimulating the economy. And with our construction project, it employed 200 people. <coughs> Um, and we work with 100 main companies for that as well. Service also promotes tourism. Forestry, or paper, and tourism are the two biggest industries in the state of Maine. And, and, and uh, bringing tourists to Maine, again, we're excited that we have Freeport and Brunswick, but still a lot of people come to Old Orchard Beach and to um, Portland. In fact, last year, 70,000 people came to Maine on the train for tourism purposes. And those people spend a lot of money, and that translates to $12 million in tax revenues associated with the spending of the, the tourism there. And for the people who ride it, it saves them time and money. And we all know that time is money. I kind of laughed a little bit early about the billable hours thing, but if you're a business owner, or you're a business person, or a business owner particularly, and you have employees that, go, that travel on business and you need to reimburse their expenses, think about it. We'll round things off so it's easier to put into context. Say it's 100 miles between Portland and Boston. So if you had an employee that was going to go down there for a, a, a business for the day, and the IRS reimbursement rate for travel is 57 cents, it would be $57 one way to send them. So that's $114 round trip. Then $12 in tolls. Now you're up to 126 Then you add in $30 to park the car, so that's 156 plus the fact that they've completely wasted five hours doing nothing other than keeping themselves in an improved quality of life. And I know that you folks here, as I said, are as protective and appreciative of your natural environment as we are in Maine. One mile of double track railroad has the same carrying capacity, passenger carrying capacity, as 14 lanes of highway. I mean, you think about that. You think about that in terms of bringing new businesses, how your economy is going to grow. Do you want to keep paving stuff wider or, or, or have a way to be able to move people more efficiently, and that's the decision that we've made in the state of Maine. Also, we've used this service as a catalyst to really bring communities together. Another program we partner with is for 11 years, we sponsored the Marine Corps Toys for Tots. For a week in December, every day we bring 200 kids up on a train, we give them a free trip. If they bring a toy, they get off, they give the toys to the Marines, we sing jingle bells, we send them back home again, and it's a great thing. All those things are really important. But success is not accidental. We work at this all the time. We meet every other month with all of our station communities, keeping everybody pulling together, not just for the operation of the service, but sharing ideas, um, exchanging things, talking about the accomplishments, and helping each other grow the economies and bring some life into these downtown centers. And that's what I have seen over the course of the last 10 years, is life breathed into these downtown centers. Um, we work hard at it, we continue to educate, we educate each other, we educate the public, um, we educate our policymakers, we communicate, we tell the good stories all the time. And we know that it's really important to always be patient and persistent because none of these projects come along um, or happen very quickly. So the Amtrak down Easter, as you can see now, is very important to the businesses, the investors, the travelers, the workers, the visitors, the students, and the communities, and mostly the people of northern New England and really is much more than just a train ride. So I thank you for your time. Well, thank you, Patricia Quinn, for such a, I don't know, enlightening and uh, encouraging presentation. So uh, thank you for coming all the way to Iowa. Okay, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. That's uh, Jock, Jock Fruin. Jock. Jeff is, uh, Jeff is the assistant city manager for the city of Iowa City. Um, 
since uh, December 2011 to uh, the present. Uh, Jeff served several positions in Normal, Illinois, including most recent, recently as the Assistant City Manager. Uh, Jeff has a Bachelor of Business Administration from the University of Iowa. And I've already cautioned him about uh, any you know, Hawkeye or Husker jokes in this class. And he has a master's of, Master of Urban Planning and Public Policy from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Jeff, you want to take it away? Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, today. And um, I'll tell you a little bit of a story of normal Illinois. It's going to take a lot of the concepts that Patricia talked about and really break it down to a fairly detailed case study. Um, and I, I titled the presentation, How Normal Illinois Changed the Definition. And in normal, when we, we went through, and what I'm going to describe to you is a, a, a very significant urban revitalization project of our downtown, a complete rebirth of our downtown. And we used the slogan, changing the definition. <coughs> For us, it was an obvious play on our, our name, Normal Illinois. Um, but what we try to do with the community with that slogan is, is really to get them to rethink and reimagine what downtown could be because we really saw a different vision than what was actually on the streets. Um, today for the presentation, I hope that uh, uh, perhaps we can change your definition or your perception of, of passenger rail, um, specifically targeting some of the economic development aspects of passenger rail. So a little bit about Normal, Illinois. It's a Midwestern uh, university community. Illinois State University is there. It's about 53,000 people. Uh, located in the heart of central Illinois. Insurance is the big industry, home of state farm insurance, country insurance, uh, but also a major health care uh, uh, provider with two regional medical centers and uh, a, a very strong automotive uh, industry as well. <coughs> Mitsubishi Motors has their North American uh, plant there, so a lot, of, a lot of auto. And I gave you the economic development map that uh, we produced in Normal uh, to give you a sense of, of uh, I guess context of where we are, and I got to thinking about these economic development maps, and, and, and every city has one of these maps, and, and I wanted to test that theory, and so I, I checked and uh, looked at Des Moines, and certainly could found found their their, their map, and then I, I looked uh, on your websites, and I found the Council Bluffs map, and it, it kind of gives me a chuckle. It's like we all think you know we're all touting the same thing, and we think that we found the the you know the answer, the silver bullet to economic development. But at the heart, what is this all about? It's, it's because transportation drives the economy. Yeah. And so we all want to tout our transportation advantages. And I want you to think about that uh, you know, as, we, as, as we talk about uh, the normal Illinois study. The other thing I want to <coughs> mention related to that is, is how transportation drives the economy is changing. Okay, in, in decades past, it was primarily, perhaps solely about moving goods, okay? And as Tri Patricia mentioned, it's more than that now. It's about connectivity to workforces. It's about opening up business opportunities. Um, it's about creating a quality of life that attracts and retains a workforce uh, in, in today's world where workforces are more mobile than ever before. So let's uh, keep that in mind as we go through that. Here's a picture of uh, downtown normal. Uh, in the uh, in the 1950s, and please forgive me if I uh, if I go back and forth between downtown and uptown normal. Um, it is the same area. There, it, it's uh, when we changed the definition of normal, we literally changed the, the the name of it. We changed it to uptown normal as again as a way to express how big of a project this was and how. Um, how this really was a reinvention. So you're going to see uptown and downtown normal same spot. Then what happened, right? This could be a picture from anywhere in the U.S. We had suburban sprawl. We had large shopping centers built on the outskirts of town. We had strip malls uh, that were built, uh, really catering to the automobile. And of course, how did that leave downtowns? And these are pictures of normal, but they can be pictures in any city across the across the United States. Vacant buildings, building maintenance conditions suffer. Um, retail traffic is down. You see buildings that were converted from traditional retail spots to kind of back office where, where there wasn't any traffic on, there weren't driving traffic on the streets. We had one thing going for us. So that, those were our conditions in, in, in downtown normal. 
And we were to the point that the city leaders said, it's time. You know, we need to do something here. Uh, we can't let this slip any further. And so we looked for ways, uh, we looked for our strategies on, on how we were going to reinvent. And uh, we kept coming back to this. So we call this our AMSHAC. And, I, and, and you know, for anybody that's with Amtrak in the audience, I apologize. We, 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 we were very loving in the way we expressed the, uh, our um, fondness of our station here. But we had a station, this is in downtown Normal, and it served at the time, right around the early 2000s, it served 70,000 riders per year. The facility was, was an embarrassment. It was woefully inadequate. Um, we had terrible maintenance problems. It was very common to have you know, the roof leaking, the lobby was in terrible condition. And as we looked at it, we said, you know, we have 70,000 people coming in to downtown normal each year, but they're not integrating themselves with the downtown. They're actually pulling up in their cars, and they're sitting in their cars waiting for the train to come, and then they hop on the train and they get right back in the cars. And we said, you know what, we have something here, we're just not using it correctly. And so, we decided uh, to gear our whole massive redevelopment project around the train. We said, instead of ignoring this asset, let's embrace it and let's leverage it and see what we can do with it. And uh, what happened is that it became the second busiest station in Illinois. Uh, it became the fourth busiest in the Midwest, next to Union Station in Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Louis. We're pretty close. We were pretty close to St. Louis. I'm not sure what the ridership numbers in St. Louis have done, but. We were on their we were on their coattails there. It's busier than places like Denver, busier than Kansas City, busier than Orlando, and it became one of the fastest growing stations in the nation. I talked about the redevelopment plan. I want to talk why why it became the, one of the fastest growing stations in the nation and why we had so much success. We uh, this is a an urban planning document talking about how we were going to reinvent our downtown. It shows the different land uses that we have and talks about the vision for the different areas. And uh, what I want to show you is uh, you the center here, the yellow piece in the map. It's the centerpiece of the, of, the, of the plan. That was a new train station. All right? The previous train station was on the other side of the tracks right here. Our, our lovely Amshack. We were going to flip it to the other side of the tracks and again that was going to be the centerpiece of our plan. Um, that tells you, you know, that was at a time, that's in the early 2000s. And <coughs> You know, if you think back to that time, passenger rail, uh, you know, I think over the last maybe five years, passenger rail has been kind of a fashionable, trendy thing. It, it came up, uh, made a, you know, we had uh, President Obama come in, there was a big push for passenger rail. Well, the, the, the city leaders in Normal, our mayor and council, they jumped on board the train, so to speak, well before it became kind of a fashionable thing that everybody was trying to do. Um, and so they made that the centerpiece of the plan. And they said, we need a modern facility that welcomes people, that invites people, that, that uh, people want to come to, uh, unlike the, the existing station that we have. We said, if people feel safe and they feel welcome, they're going to be more likely to ride. Had to be connected to other modes of transit. <coughs> Connectivity is so important. And our existing station uh, that we had did not have the necessary connections. All these services were available throughout the community, all these modes of transportation. We had airport shuttles to our local airport, a regional one, but also up to Chicago, to their two airports, but it wasn't connected to the train service. Our local bus system, if you wanted to catch the local bus and try to then catch Amtrak, you had to walk two blocks. Now, if we're all carrying luggage, it's just not gonna happen. Pedestrian trips, we wanted to make sure that we had pedestrian bike facilities at the station too, because that's an important and we said, if we can do that, if, if we can carry out this vision, this can be the anchor of a massive redevelopment project. And so there's the, the vision that the council set in the early 2000s for the, for the new station. Um, now, I don't want to stand up here and tell you um, that if you get passenger rail, Council Bluff is going to see some economic boom. That's not, just the mere presence of passenger rail doesn't create uh, automatically economic uh, opportunities. You have to figure out how to embrace it, how to leverage that investment. For normal, our service started back in 1971. Okay, So it took us a good 30 years to figure out how to use rail. But once we figured it out, I think, hopefully you'll agree that the results were quite impressive. So for us, we knew that 
not only did we have to improve and expand passenger rail service, we needed the new station, we needed to increase frequency of the, of the trains, but we had to build some complementary infrastructure too. And we had to do that first. The government had to lead on that. And we uh, had a council with the political will to, to go forward and, with this vision. So we had to build parking facilities. We built new roads. This is actually, uh, it's Constitution Boulevard. It's, it's not a road reconstruction. That's a brand new road. We had to uh, buy properties, tear it down, and, and build a new road uh, into our downtown to open up access. We had to create defining public spaces. This is an old three-way intersection that was uh, really tricky to navigate. And uh, we came up with a concept to uh, build a large roundabout with a park-like setting in the middle. So we had to create that defining space that uh, created a venue that people wanted to be seen at. They wanted you know, to, to see and be seen at. The building in the back is a children's discovery museum. That was actually a, uh, a, a public, a, a local government-led project there that, that we started in the early 2000s. Um, that's part of our was part of our parks and recreation uh, facility there. So we had to not only say it wasn't as simple as just saying, "Hey, we just need to embrace a passenger rail." We had to think in the context of a broader plan, and that's what the challenge is for any city that has passenger rail. You not only have to get it, which is a challenge, but you have to learn how to uh, leverage it. And for us, it meant a significant amount of public investment. We created new streetscapes. So we, we made our sidewalks wider. We tried to uh, create opportunities uh, for sidewalk uh, cafes. Uh, we wanted to create kind of a head-turning landscape that really gave Uptown Normal a, a very unique uh, and distinctive feel. And then we had to cross our fingers and hope that we were right with the private development. And, and <laughs> I, I say that jokingly because we knew early on when we started in the planning, um, in the planning stages of this, uh, of this effort, the private development uh, groups were very interested. We had a lot of folks that were really anxious and really pushing us to move forward with some of our initial investments so that they could follow suit. Uh, John Q. Hammonds is a prominent ho hotel developer. Uh, one of the first uh, major investments that were made after uh, we announced the plan, we started to move forward. This opened up in uh, late 2008 early 2009. This is directly across the street from uh, the rail station. And the point I want to make here, uh, because it's an argument that I hear frequently, and it's something that uh, we, we encountered in normal to some degree, but I think we, we hear it more in Iowa because there's, there's no existing service, is that if you build rail, you're going to be exporting your, your uh, economic activity to Chicago and to other areas. And it's quite the contrary. If, and it's not just normal. We can pull case studies from around the country. Patricia had some good examples, too. It creates economic opportunities for you. And one of the largest hotel developers in the world sat across from us on a conference table, and he wasn't going to build this thing until he knew that we were serious about the rail projects that we were talking about. Now, there's a large conference center that's attached to this that you can't see, but, you know, think, if you think about it, if he was worried that business was going to flee town, and go to the larger metropolitan areas that we were connected to. Uh, so I think, I think that gives an example of how, how the private sector responds. But there's plenty of other examples. This is a, an existing bank that uh, expanded their property, a $13 million facility at the time. Uh, we saw new investment uh, in, in a lot of uh, push for residential. You see the residential component above the, above the CVS pharmacy there. This building was constructed probably 2010. It's about a block from the station. We saw local uh, existing storefronts turn over and exciting new concepts come in. Now, this is a local restaurant that opened. Uh, historic properties that were underutilized uh, started to become renovated. This is an Irish pub uh, that, uh, that opened up just a block or two from the stadium. And existing businesses that uh, saw the activity happening around them and said, hey, we need to clean up, we need to clean up our storefronts a little bit and we need to uh, kind of keep up with what's going on here in, in downtown Normal. This is a shot uh, of downtown Normal as it looks today. You see the train coming in on the, the top right. And uh, what you'd see if we stepped out even further is, is really it's a, it's a nice mix of, of new facilities and existing storefronts. And for us that was the right, that was the right model, that was the right formula. 
every city it's a little different. Uh, we saw the examples from uh, the Down Easter line, and every city can kind of embrace it in a way. Some, some train stations come through downtowns, others don't. And you have to really figure out what works best for you in order to leverage that. Now this is the opening of the station. I had left for the position in Iowa City um, before we had a chance to open the station. I went back this summer for the opening to celebrate with some of my uh, former colleagues. And I, I don't expect you to know anything about Illinois politics, so you might not recognize anything in there, any of the faces in there. Frankly, I'd prefer that you don't know much about <laughs> Illinois politics. So um, I don't want to give you, I don't want to give you a whole background on that. But one thing uh, in Illinois, when it comes to passenger rail, is strong bipartisan support. And I can tell you everybody on here, there's a lot of Republicans, a lot of Democrats on there, state, local, federal level. Our biggest advocates, we were kind of in a Republican country uh, in, in central Illinois there, and, and our representatives at the state and federal level um, actually uh, had the biggest role in getting us the early funded funding that we needed to pursue um, the, the passenger train enhancements that we talked about. It's not just Illinois where this is a bipartisan issue. Uh, we've got examples of that in Michigan. Just a few days ago, uh, Republican Governor uh, McConnell in, uh, in Virginia announced his new transportation vision for that state, and that included uh, expansion of Amtrak service. Since 2009, that's going to be their fourth expansion of Amtrak service in Virginia. So there's examples across the country about how bipartisan support, um, uh, there, there is bipartisan su support uh, for, for passenger rail. Now, I think it's a little different here in Iowa for, for one reason than those other states that I mentioned. Certainly in Illinois, we had the asset already. We knew what we had. We may not have been using it right, but people could see it. People could understand it. And they knew, they believed in it. it, was a system that they believed in, because it was right out their back door. Here we don't have that. Now, we, yes, we have an Amtrak that goes through uh, southern Iowa. That's a, that's a coastal route. That's a route that originates in California to Chicago. Uh, and that's apples to oranges from the regional rail system that we're talking about here. It's a very different type of experience, and it has very different economic impacts. Um, when uh, contrasting those two. So again, I, I'm going to ask you again to, to be open to changing your definition of passenger rail and, and your perceptions of, of passenger rail. This is the new Uptown Station that uh, opened up a few months back in Normal. And um, the upper floors of that facility are, are new city offices, council chambers. And I think that spoke a lot, a lot um, to how strongly our leaders felt about passenger rail. They, they felt it enough to make it the most prominent civic building in our community. They wanted to, to make that the city hall as well. So it's a combined city hall uh, transportation center. Not only accommodates rail, but it accommodates buses. So we have uh, three bus lines, Greyhound, Trailways, uh, and Megabus that, that are served by this facility. And that's a question that you, you, you might have too, is you know how does that competition work? And I think in areas where you, you find those uh, services together, you find that it's not really competition, that it's really complementary services and they work very well together. It's just an outside shot looking into the lobby. Here's a picture of the, the waiting area for uh, the rail um, portion of the, of the station. There's the ticketing area. And then the, uh, the platform, the boarding area. Now, if, if, you, if you recall earlier in the presentation, I said in fiscal year, I think it's fiscal year 2003 are the numbers I used, we had 73,000 riders either board or get off in, in normal. In 2011, almost 245,000 uh, riders. And there's, there's a lot of reasons for it. So that's about a 225% increase uh, over that seven, eight year period. It's a phenomenal increase. At, uh, at one time, it was the fastest growing station in, in the Amtrak system. Now, um, we, we think that a good portion of that is due to the investments that we made uh, and, and the, 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 the kind of the heightened attention that we, we gave to rail. But also during that time, we worked with our state and our uh, federal and our Amtrak partners to expand the frequency. 
So we have uh, right now a 79 mile per hour service, and there are uh, nine uh, nine trips a day. Uh, I'm sorry, ten trips a day. Um, so five round trips between Chicago and St. Louis. Uh, you know that type of growth um, really speaks to the to the private uh, the private industry and private developers. And, and I, I guess going back, just, just finishing up there, again, that's fiscal year 2011. That's before the new station opened. I should, I should make the point that out. Um, and, and I sit back and I think and say, okay, now you have a convenient station that uh, has parking connected to it, that's connected to the other modes of transit, uh, that's welcoming. This number is going to continue to grow, and it's going to continue to grow at a rapid pace. The other thing that's going on right now is there's a big push to move from those five round trips a day to nine round trips a day. So your frequency is going to go up and continue to drive these numbers up. And the last and perhaps most important part is that they're currently upgrading from 79 mile per hour service to 110 mile per hour service. So what you're going to see is faster service, more frequent service. And I, I personally think, and this is just my opinion, I think the folks in, in normal would agree with me though, that the 222%, 225% increase from fiscal year 2003 to 2011 may look, kind of, may look pretty small compared to what the next 10 years holds for that community. And uh, you know, Patricia used the, the word game changer for us. And, and normal's at a point where uh, we're, at, we're kind of at that game changing moment. We're, a, we're about a two and a half hour drive from both Chicago and St. Louis metropolitan areas. And if you've ever been in those areas, um, you know that an hour and a half uh, commute into the city from the suburbs is pretty standard for a lot of folks. <coughs> well, now all of a sudden, you can get 110 mile per hour service. You can get there. Now the commute times, we've, we've loved the playing field. So the commute times in, in normal are equal to those in the, in the Chicago metropolitan area. And all of a sudden, it's a big economic opportunity for normal. We have perhaps more affordable housing. We can argue that we have better educational opportunities. And we can really start to um, attract and build a workforce that's going to support our economy uh, for the next, uh, next several decades. So here's, an, here's, a, here's a big, broad, broad overview of the numbers. I told you that there had to be risk, and there had to be political will and leadership. And, $98 million for a town of 53,000 is a lot of money to put forward into a plan. I, I, I don't take that lightly, and our political leaders don't take that lightly, lightly. But they believed in the vision, they believed in the plan, and they set forward. That's $98 million, that's, that's in. That's not per, you know, perspective. None of these numbers are, are perspective. $33 million from the federal government, $1.2 million. And from 2003, roughly, to, to the present, we've had over $200 million in private investment. Now the best part of this is that the, that the government of, uh, investments, those top three, those are more or less done now. You're not going to see those grow in any considerable amount. There will be some maintenance costs, sure. Um, but that private number, that's going to tick. And that's going to continue to tick. And it's going to continue uh, to grow quite a bit. Now how do you measure success? Well, one measure is you look at property values and what impacts it had. This is an article just a couple weeks back from the uh, local paper in Illinois. And you see from 2005 to, to, to this year, property values in the downtown area right around the train station have nearly doubled. Now, folks, we just went through one of the, the largest recessions that we've, we've experienced here in this country. Uh, I don't know if there's another place in the country that saw their downtown property values double during that time period. Most were lucky just to, just to kind of hang on. So that, that speaks quite a bit about uh, how the market responded there. And again, that 200 million is going to continue to grow. Not counting, not counting in that 200 million is a project that was just announced in December, uh, right across from the train station. It's a 32 million dollar hotel, uh, mixed use uh, hotel complex. And again, that speaks to that concern that business is going to be exporting. There were a lot of a lot of detractors that said a hotel would never be successful there. Well, it was so successful that another hotel uh, developer came in and. and uh, is planning to break ground this uh, this year and, and build this facility. Uh, so I'm going to wrap up with some lessons and then kind of a sales pitch for Illinois. Uh, I'm sorry, sales pitch for, for real in Iowa. Uh, I don't, I don't want to pitch Illinois. I'm glad to be in Iowa. Uh, government, we must be willing to invest. Okay, but you, you you can't just blindly invest, and that's why 
Uh, I don't fault the state of Iowa one bit for taking a step back a couple of years ago and saying, hey, we need to look at the broader context because this isn't a, this isn't a, a Chicago to Iowa City um, project. This is about building a transportation network that can serve the entire state, and the state needs to look at it in that context. So the plan that's going on right now, I know there's been public meetings here. Um, I think that's a key component to this. What's your rate of return? You should always have a, a return on investment. Now you need to figure out, we all need to figure out how we quantify that. Because in different areas of the state, it could be different things. Um, it could be how much private investment are you going to track? How much roadway congestion are you going to relieve? How much infrastructure will, uh, investments will benefit uh, freight services? Are there crossing upgrades, public safety upgrades? the environment, all these things, we need to figure out what we expect from this project, and we need to make sure that we're going to get that. Otherwise, it's not a wise investment. Passenger rail can drive development. I think uh, we, we touched on that. The key is regional rail here. Uh, it's, it's, it's a long-term investment. The, 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 little, the, the expense that we're um, asking the state to make now um, is, is hopefully an investment that will pay dividends for generations to you know, something that surprised us in normal that we didn't really think of as the rail grew, we tried to look at our ridership and what segments of, of the market were growing. Uh, it was certainly not just our local city riders that were benefiting. There was a lot of impact to rural populations. Uh, Patricia mentioned her partnership with the American Cancer Society. Um, we saw a lot of that in normal as a medical center um, for the, for the uh, aging uh, population. That was an increasingly um, viable form of transportation for them. So that, uh, that kind of surprised us a little bit. But then also, we looked at it as we've got to secure our workforce uh, for the next generation. And again, the workforce is more mobile today than it ever has been before. The, the workforce wants connections. They want to be able to go to these uh, metropolitan areas. They want the quality of life of, of, of smaller towns. We need to have those diversity of transportation options to secure that workforce. All right, here's my quick pitch for Iowa. This is the map of the regional rail system that's being developed. Just for a minute, take out this green line here. That's the that's the proposed line through Iowa. Folks, what's happening all around? It's happening all around us. Are we going to be a part of it or not? And if, we, if we're not, then I think we have to realize that we're going to be at an economic disadvantage. Amtrak ridership, uh, their, their growth rates are, are phenomenal. Uh, this is, shows the last uh, um, 10 or 12 years. In the last 10 years, they've set nine ridership records. Uh, just last year alone, 25 of their 44 routes set ridership records. The only decrease here that you, that you see, that's during the 2008, that's, that's at a time, that's the recessionary time when all modes of transportation quickly plummeted. Um, and what you see, you saw a very quick rebound, faster rebound than uh, I would argue uh, of the other modes of transportation. So this is the last slide here. Um, this is this is an unprecedented opportunity for us to get going. Yes, we'd love to see rail service um, all the way extended through the state from the start. And I know coming from an Iowa City person, um, you know, I, I think it's it's take my advocacy with a grain of salt, I guess, because we certainly want phase one here in the <coughs> city. But we've got to get started here. You can't take off uh, and, and do big chunks of this all at once. The, the cost is, is, is too prohibitive. Um, so if we don't get this first step in, we can't, begin, we can't start to build that network that we need for this entire state. And if we turn away the funds, they're just going to go to the, the states around us, um, folks, and, and they're going to continue to grow and prosper, and, and we're going to be set back. And then I'll end with the, the transportation and the economy uh, piece because I think that's so important. Um, think back to those maps that I showed on, this, on that first or second slide, and, and we all tout our, our transportation advantages. The nature of transportation and what that means to the economy is changing. We need as many connections as possible. They need to be affordable. They need to be efficient. They need to be productive. And passenger rail is a great way uh, for us to get you in that direction. So I have thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Um, before we get started with um, questions and answers, 
I do want to recognize a few people in the room. I think I recognized uh, Mayor Tom Hannafin. We've got another elected official here, Councilwoman Sharon White, and uh, County Supervisor Lynn Leaders. Lynn, I didn't see you sneak in. I saw you last night, but uh, a little late, wasn't it? Anyone else? Anybody else? Any other elected officials we ought to recognize? Okay, um, before we get on with question and answers, how about we just, everybody just stand up and let's just take a little stretch. Right? Uh, is that a good idea? Uh, I have a question for Patricia and Jeff. What kind of advice can you give us to approach our, and what lessons did you learn that we could use to approach our legislators in helping move this project along? Patricia? I think um, one of the most important things is to um, arm yourself with facts um, and make this not an emotional argument. You know, a, a lot of times, a lot of people feel very fondly about trains, and, and I think for the, for the people who aren't supportive of passenger rail, um, you know, they, they make the argument that it's all about being romantic and those kind of things. Everything that you've heard here today is really about hard economic facts. It's about you know improving economies. It's about moving people. It's about improving and preserving quality of life. So I think arming yourself with facts. Um, you know, as I said, the Down Easter started as part of a citizens' initiative. That group is still very actively involved today, um, and we still need to continue to educate people. So I would say continue to educate and arm yourself with facts because if you know if these things are important to you, then that's what you should be talking about. Jeff, do you have any add to that? You know, I, I guess I I I'd stress. The, the same thing and, and that you have to look at this as a as a business decision and and figure out what's important to us as a state to, to, to this region of the state uh, what's that rate of return that you, you expect and and you know, drill down to those issues and make that case at the end of the day I want my elected officials um, to make a good business decision for the state on this or any other issue and so as, as Patricia said you got to strip out some of the political um, issues that I think muddy the water and focus in on those, those business economic type uh, facts and figures. Thank you. And you mentioned about normal. Was, first of all, were there tracks right there in downtown, right there? Because here, you know, we have the tracks down here that go on the divide around between 8th and 16th Street. It's a little bit away from the immediate downtown area and just down there the rails west there's tracks there too but if people want to get on i mean they'd have to go a little way to reach the downtown area from the, and those tracks you know every city is going to be a little different and yes the, the tracks uh were exist in normal before this project were downtown as well we literally just moved the station to the other side of the tracks um, but every every situation is very different um, Patricia, I know, uh, talked about, uh, we talked about some of the, the station stops that she has. Some are located in downtown, some are located along the coast, uh, others in other parts of the community. And that's why it's really important for uh, local communities and the, the local regions to figure out how best can we leverage it here. Because, you know, a, a downtown setting is much different than one that's, you know, perhaps a mile or two off. I, I would argue that there's great opportunities in any location. Um, but there's very different strategies that you can pursue, and there's, there's different expectations for the type of development activity that you, you would see in those areas. Yeah, I, I've got a couple more on technical questions, too, both from this clear. Uh, one, you mentioned the operating budget is Is there any kind of debt service in addition to that? Any other kind of money in addition to the operating budget? Yeah. Um, right now, other than capital projects, and those are funded, most of them right now are funded through some of the, the capital federal grants that we've gotten, but that's really the only obligation other than any additional capital projects we want. The other question is, is there an idea of total factor on this? I do. It really varies by train, so if I, if I tell you one overall for the service, it's 37 percent is a load factor. Uh -huh. I can tell you that on train 680, which is the first one out in the morning, it's over 95. I can tell you at 687, at 682 is the second one out, it's about 87 percent. 
the, the ones that come back are a little bit lower, and so you kind of have to, they, they kind of, you know, they balance each other out. So some do better than others, but the way our system works, where they, they kind of go in a circle, they go down, and then they come back. You kind of take people, you got to come back, and then go. So that's why we market so hard, because we have to really kind of create some demand. That's why this extension to Freeport and Brunswick was so important to us, because we can fill up those two trains in the morning easily and send people to, to Boston for work or leisure or whatever it might be, but it's now having the opportunity to bring them and, and give them, give up people from there the reason to come to Maine and great places to visit to try to balance those flows. So it's also a work in progress, so um, I, I hope that answers your question. Roland? Yes, Tracy. On the Northeast, Patricia, uh, will you be connecting into Canada and, and also will you be going up to high speed? Um, we're kind of far from Canada where we are. Um, I know that there's some the routes that are going through New Hampshire and Ver Vermont that have some expectations of connecting. I, I know there's some long-term plans looking at connecting to Montreal. I don't, I don't think that's going to be realistic for us in, in the short term. Um, and in terms of increasing our speeds, you know, right now our railroad is built to 79 miles an hour. We're doing some planning and we're looking at, you know, what it would take to upgrade. In all honesty, right now we're trying to take the 60s and, you know, 50s and 60s that we have and getting them up to 60s and 70s, kind of increasing the incremental speed. Um, we have a lot of station stops, so for us, going to 110 miles an hour is really going to be just a fragment. So we probably wouldn't on that particular line, um, but we're looking at that and we'll balance the cost. I, I don't think there's going to be a good argument for that on our particular line. Sir, we'll get one back here. Yeah, I'd like to know uh, what routes are being considered. And also, I'd like to know if this train's even going to stop in Council Bluffs or is it just going to go to Omaha? <laughs> who, wants to, who wants to take that? Will, can, can, I put, Will, can I put you on the spot here? Sure. Um, Will, Will Sharp with the HDR is doing the study for the, for the Department of Transportation. He'll probably answer that better than I can. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, we're conducting a, uh, a Tier 1 environmental study that looked at the different routes to get from Chicago to Council Bluffs, Omaha. We actually just had our public hearings in December, including one in Council Bluffs. Uh, the preferred route alternative uh, will run on the Iowa interstate through Iowa, and uh, a stop is planned in, in Council Bluffs as well as Omaha. 